<laughs> and then and then and then came ninety five, and that's when you guys got your. I mean, the Springboks got revenge on New Zealand for what they'd done to you in the series the year before. No. But whenever I've spoken to you, I've always got the impression that well, while that should have been the real highlight of your career and something you're really happy about, there was always like a, maybe a little bit of a tinge, maybe because you were playing out of position. I remember you played number eight in, in the important games of the world. I mean, the two uh, playoff fun. games at the, at the World Cup. Um, but to tell, tell me about that. Why, why did you, I mean, did, why, why was it that you sort of feel like it wasn't quite the highlight of your career? It should possibly have been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, by the time 95, I, I, I'd been bad at almost 94 against All Blacks. Um, I'd had a great tour. Um, I'd really enjoyed the rugby. It was tough, it was hard. It's the way I like, like it played. Um, end of that, 94, we went to um, Europe. Uh, we were there for almost six weeks, seven weeks. Um, I, I was now starting to back myself as knowing that I could be one of the best locks in the world. I, I, I was, I was, I had a lot of confidence. Um, I was getting stronger. I, I was just really starting to come into my own, I think, as a second row. That World Cup came along. Um, I, I was, I played, I think, uh, two games against, um, the opening game against Australia. I didn't have a good game. Lost quite a few line outs. James Dalton and I didn't find each other. Um, and then played against Samoa in the quarterfinal. Um, fractured a rib. I uh, scored a try. But, but I, I was, I, I, I think I was man of the match in that game. Um, but, but I was starting to like, okay, now it's coming to the, to the big league stuff, the, the playoffs and that. And, and I'm, I can show the world or show myself or prove to myself that I am one of the best locks around. Because at that stage, there was Olivia Ruma. Um, there was, uh, I'm not sure Kelly played for Ireland. There was the, uh, Robin Brook and Jones, the All Blacks. There were some great locks in, in the world, world rugby that stage. And I was determined to, to prove I was good enough to be on their level. And then Kitch put me at eighth man. We are seriously hadn't played from under 15, I think, the last time I played. I was out of position. Um, I wasn't comfortable. And it was very frustrating because I knew that if I played lock, I could really have been something, some, I could have played some great rugby in, in the semi final and final. And I ended up playing eighth man. And it was so stressful because I was expected to still jump and, and do kickoffs that as a lock four, but I was expected of many in defense um, to, uh, to be an eighth man. And it's highly stressful because in those days, the eighth man stood out in defense. He didn't have to be behind the scrum. So, so I was having to learn a whole new almost game rugby in, in five days before the, the French game. Um, so I was completely out of my depth, out of my comfort zone. And very few people are having fun when they're taken out of their comfort zone. So I think if I if I'd stayed at lock, I would have been a lot more enjoyable World Cup for me. It was incredibly stressful. Probably the most stress I've been through my whole life. And no one likes that amount of stress. I remember driving to the training session before the final and seeing again, I hope it wasn't you, Gav or Brennan, on a billboard, will Andrews cost us the final? And I was a 23-year-old lighty and you <laughs> drive in and you and you thinking, geez, the whole of South Africa is thinking, is Andrews playing eighth man going to cost us the, the final? It's, it's a hell of a lot of pressure to, to, to have at that age in your life. It, w it wasn't me. I wasn't the rugby writer at that stage. I was still a, a, a community paper. But <laughs> I have had a couple I of... I think it was a citizen. You haven't for the citizen then. I did write, but just after that, 96. So, um, That's what I was saying. <laughs> no, that wasn't me. I, 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 I plead innocence there. While, while we're on 95, and obviously, Rossi made a very interesting statement last year when he was uh, starting with the World Cup preparations. And he, he said to us there in Pretoria that you guys realize that anybody under the age of, of 30 probably doesn't remember that 95 World Cup final. Now, one, it dates you, but I mean, have you thought about that? Do you still get the same sort of, obviously, it's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I've, um, I'll say this. When I was playing rugby, I appreciated the, the fans. I really did. I appreciated the support and, and some diehard supporters. As a player, you really appreciate it. But it gets to a stage in your life where, where you start wanting your privacy again. Everywhere you go, people recognize you. Especially after 95, it became manic. It became crazy. I couldn't go to a restaurant. I couldn't go to a supermarket. I couldn't anywhere without people walking up and on autographs. And, and thankfully, there weren't those cell phone cameras in those days. So, but, but it was crazy. I, I'm a, I like to think I'm a pretty private person. I like, I like my own space, my own time. Um, and I find it hard work to, to, and to always 
be in in, in the public eye. Um, it wasn't something which I which I strive for and, and and wanted. So when I retired from rugby, it was the first couple of years. Still, people knew I was and, and would approach me, and then cell phone cameras came in. So, but then after about five or six or seven years, less people would see, oh, there's Mark Andrews, but no one would come into my space, and no one would come in and demand and know what I think about the rugby. And, that. and I was really enjoying it. And then it was a World Cup, I think about two World Cups ago. And I was walking somewhere and I used to walk up half again. And a guy walked past his son, must have been 10, 12 years old. And he was like, okay, he like stopped him and said, Mark Andrews, Mark. Like he turned around and the guy, and the guy turns his son and he goes, that's Mark Andrews. <laughs> and you could just check this absolute blank <laughs> look in the light his face like, who? That's Mark Andrews. And the light is going like, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about here. And the old man thought, and most times what happened was that I could ask for a photograph. But I knew it wasn't for his lighty. He said, I can't have a photograph of my son. It was for him. Because uh, his lighty had no clue who I was. He just wanted a photograph for me. <laughs> so, uh, to be honest, you know, I've had my time in the limelight. I've had my time in the, in the, in the sunshine. Um, I, don't, I don't miss it at all. Um, I'm just grateful for, for the experience that I had. And as, as us old guys joke, uh, the older we get, the better we were. So, there's a plus side to it. <laughs> I just was going to ask you, I mean, obviously, people, a lot of people, the younger generation probably remember 95 through Invictus now, through the movie there. How did you feel watching that? Because uh, <laughs> the rugby wasn't very good in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, you know, <laughs> the whole thing, was that, 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 there was quite a, a special part to that, in that right before the final screening, at uh, well, the end of shooting, we were invited the 95 side to come and meet Clint Eastwood, Matt Damon, uh, Morgan Freeman, and have dinner with them. Um, and I remember uh, Clint Eastwood stood up and we were in this private room and he said, gentlemen, I can't uh, quote him exactly, but he said, gentlemen, thank you for coming. Oh, blah, blah, blah. He said, uh, I want you to please understand. This is a movie about Nelson Mandela. It's not a movie about the 95 Rugby World Cup side. As great as the achievement that you did, he said, um, I think it was Laurie McCready, McCready the, the woman who bought the, 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 the rest of the book with Morgan Freeman. And apparently the movie came about and then Morgan Freeman told us and that um, when he met Nelson Mandela, Mandela said to him, if they ever make a movie about me, I want you to play me. And they actually bought the rights, I think first the long walk uh, to freedom they couldn't quite uh, work it out into a movie. And when, when, when Invictus came along, they bought that purely to, for Morgan Freeman to fulfill like a, a, um, almost a pledge he'd made in Nelson Mandela that he would play him in a movie uh, one day. So Clint Eastwood made it very clear to us, not about you guys, you guys are just a sideshow. The rugby is terrible, but the, the Americans who the market's for, know nothing about rugby. So they'll think it's fantastic. Please don't be offended. Have a lovely evening. And... Nice to meet you all, and he went back to bed. Gabby, <laughs> you want to come in again? Well, Mark, is a, oh, I was going to talk about 96 and, and, and losing to the All Blacks because Brennan was actually writing by then at The Citizen. Um, how, how much of a, how much of a, of a role did the, the spring, the way, I mean, you guys all got those Springbok kick contracts, and we, we know how those contracts came about. We know about the sort of brinkmanship between Francois and Louis Leite and all that. Um, but how much of a division was that? And how much of a setback, how much did it set South Africa back in, in the following year when, when Andre Mahrov ended up being the coach and took over a group that was, you know, every, every new guy that came in wasn't getting paid the same as, as, as you guys were. And I know John Allen told me at some stage that when you guys went back to play for the Sharks after, after the World Cup, he told you guys to bugger off out the room. Because well, you know, it was yourself, James, and Juba. Well, he used a much harder language than that. And it was, a terrible, it was actually a terrible time in, in, in my career. I mean, I was, I was a lighty, won the World Cup, um, basically had the whole rugby world at my feet. Uh, most, a lot of the guys were quite old in 95 side. I was just turned 23. And then when that whole thing happened, I was a bit oblivious to, to what was going on. It was all being managed by Francois and the older players. Um, I just wanted to play rugby. Yeah. And, when, and John's right, when we go back, to um, to the Sharks, uh, myself, Jubba and James, after we'd made it, made the, or we'd voted as an 95 side to stay with the current structures of, of, of what World Rugby is now. Um, we were told to get out the change room. 
So Juba, James, and myself had it get changed outside on the benches, outside the changes. We weren't allowed in the changes. And Mac eventually had to calm them down. I think calm Johnny down. And um, and yeah, um, for what it's worth, uh, I abstained my vote in, in, in that 95 because I didn't know what the right thing to do. I was 23. I hadn't been informed. I wasn't part of the Transvaal guys talking to Louis, talking to Francois. And I actually didn't know what to do. Um, probably cowardly. But I think a little bit wiser because I didn't know what the right answer was. So we had a, a, a um, an unwritten rule in 95 that if two thirds of the team votes on anything, you went with it. Um, and that's ultimately how we agreed to stay um, in the current rugby, rugby structure. But it was a terrible time. Um, and then thereafter, you know, it, yeah, it, it didn't just end there. Um, I think we've spoken about this in 99 before the World Cup final, or the World Cup in 99. We ended up having the same situation. And uh, I'm not sure if you spoke about it in your book, but you know, it's probably when my relationship with Ren Oberholzer and South African rugby completely collapsed because I ended up being, as the most senior player and head of the players' committee, um, responsible for trying to negotiate a fair, a fair salary for all the guys for, for the World Cup. And we had some guys, Ruben Kruger had come back from an injury. I mean, Ruben wasn't on the World Cup contract anymore. He, the, 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 he wasn't on a contract. And he was, I think they'd offered him 25 or 40,000 a month. Some guys had offered 10,000 a month. Some guys um, were basically getting match fees only. Um, it was crazy. Uh, so I ended up, well, we as, as a collective, got the players to, to, to agree on what, what they all thought was fair. Um, but again, it put me, put a target straight on my head and my back with, so with South African rugby. And that's ultimately why I think my relationship with Strali completely collapsed. Because I know for a fact that he was put under immense pressure by the South African rugby union, especially Oberholzer, to not select me because of, of, the, of the, 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 the stumbling block I'd been and how much money I'd cost South African rugby in 99 by fighting for all the players to, to have a, a fair wage. Yeah, they were, I mean, that, that was how your career ended. I mean, that's when you, you eventually went into retirement. If I remember correctly, it, well, we, nobody even knew you'd retired at, at, at one point. It was like you, you went to England for a bit. And did you go to Newcastle? Where, where did you yeah, go? I went to Newcastle. Yeah, we all have to, we all have to pay our, our dues in life. And my due was, was playing rugby in Newcastle for 18 months. <laughs> was it as long as that? And you came back and that's when Rudolph told you, I think you told him that you told you at a cocktail party or something that he'd been told. No, he actually told me beforehand. So, uh, basically, what happened was uh, in 2000, Harry Flynn was was the the Springbok coach, and I've got immense respect for Harry. I mean, I, I would go so far as to say I really love that man. He was he showed huge faith in me. Um, he believed in me. He even made me captain of the Sharks at as 21 years old um, for one game. Um, I, I was I was in awe of Harry. He was just a great mind. He, he, he he was probably years ahead of his time for rugby and coaching. Um, but he was trying to juggle a huge financial business empire um, and, and also coaching. It, it was just a very hard time, I think, for him. But he had a huge passion, the guy I really enjoyed. 2000, he became the book coach. Um, and he, he put me on to a two-year, he gave me a two-year contract. And probably myself and you are um, the top contracts. So when he left in the 2001, Saru were lumped with me for, and I was only 28 years old. Um, so it isn't like I was, I was old. I was old. I was 28 years old. Probably just needed a bit more more management, and the body was a bit tired, especially the way I play. I mean, it, it, I, I broke myself quite badly. So, um, and Saru had to pay me. So in 2002, I was on the payroll the whole season, but they didn't select me. And Strali ultimately told me when I came back. Um, and I had my final tribute dinner at the Sharks. Um, and he was there. And, and he told me you now whether whether it was true or not, I don't know, but he said to me that uh, part of his agreement with Saru was that, uh, that that he'd accept the coaching position, but under condition that they never selected me again. And I think that came from Ronald Balzer. So my career was effectively uh, put on ice because of, of representing the players in a salary dispute in 99. But of course, you nearly you nearly retired years before that yourself, Gary, and Juba, and and Lim, and and Henry Honeyball. You yes, nearly you retired. <laughs> you retired yes, at the end of 
in, in 97 uh, and Malat had to come to Durban to talk you into continuing yeah. careers. Tell us the background to, to, the, to that, obviously the Lion series as well. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I've, you know, I, <laughs> I keep on threatening to, to write a book and, I, and I've been writing a lot of chapters and, and I probably am going to write one, but more for my children and my grandchildren, you know, if you one day. Um, because <laughs> every time I do interviews and you guys ask questions like this, I think back and I think it, it is actually almost like movie stuff. Um, with Sora appointed Carl Duplessy, who I think had been assisting uh, False Bay Rugby Club um, on an ad hoc basis. He went from there, never coaching anybody really, to the Springbok coach. Um, he brought Kath Small, his Ford coach, with who actually ended up being a very good coach. But at that stage, we were, after having um, Kitch Christie, um, Kitch Christie, Mark Ruff, I also rated as a coach, a little bit eccentric, but also a, a, a great solid guy who coached for years, um, Matt before that. So I've been through three fantastic coaches, and all of a sudden we got Carl, who was, I mean, we were all awestruck by Carl in that he was such a big name in, in South Africa. I mean, he was a prince of wings, he was phenomenal. But it was, you couldn't make up what happened in, in the time that he coached us. It seriously couldn't. I mean, it's, I've never shared a room with Ruben Kruger, but I know he snores because in team meetings when Carl was, was giving lectures, Ruben used to fall asleep next to me. I mean, there was just, it was, it was crazy. And yeah, we were playing the lion side, but I don't think we're the greatest lion side ever. Um, you know, it, it was just a very sad time and very frustrating time in my career. Ultimately, myself, Tash, Juba, and Lem just talking one day, we just said, we can't do this. We're not going to keep on trashing our names and the Springbok name by playing under these guys. It's just not going to happen. And we made a decision that we were going to make ourselves unavailable for selection until, until a, new coach, a new coach was elected. And they selected uh, Mallet. Um, and he'd heard that, I think he'd phoned Gary, and Gary said, um, yeah, we're not, we're not playing. We uh, until sorry, take it seriously, anything else. And then he flew to Durban, came to I think the Moron, uh, I'm not sure exactly what hotel on the beachfront. And we sat and had coffee. Uh, Adrian Garvey was with us, and he said, Guys, I need you, I really, really, South Africa needs you. He did the best sales pitch ever, and that's that's how our careers started again. And of course, in 90, when he took over, you had that brilliant tour in 97. And, and in, into 98, and you beat New Zealand twice. You beat them in Wellington and, and again in Durban. I mean, the world was at your feet. Um, and, and you've told me that, that at that particular point, Mallet was the best coach you ever had. And then it went a bit pear-shaped after that. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, it, it, it was. And, and you know, it's, 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 a, it's a bittersweet period of my career again. Um, that I really enjoyed Manit. I mean, I, I, he was a breath of fresh air. He was smart. He was intelligent. He was aggressive uh, in the way you played, hold nothing back. Um, he was, I, I really, I mean, I was loving playing underneath him. I think we all were as, as players. And then he, you know, I'm, I'm not sure Nick will ever admit to, to, to being less than perfect, but he went mad. Um, he honestly went mad. Probably the best way I can put it, and he just became unplayable, and and to play under Nick went from being playing under probably one of the best coaches I've ever played under, to playing under equivalent of Carl to see again, and it's like you've got to be kidding me. I mean, but but the sadness was is that we all knew what a phenomenal human being and coach he was, and the fact that he just lost it was was very frustrating and. And disappointed in my career. And then you played in the 99 World Cup and given that even though you won the World Cup in 95 it was still a bit bittersweet then for you because you had to play number eight. You wanted 99 and do you, do you guys do you guys really believe you, if if Nick had stayed the same that he was and if he had stuck with Gary as, as, as his captain and kept that equilibrium in the team do you guys think that you given how well you played from the end of 97 through to 98, you probably could have gone and actually retained the World Cup in 99. Yeah, I have absolutely no doubt. And, and, and it's, it's, I mean, in sport, it's very seldom we can look and say we, should have, we, we could have won that series or that game. I look back in 99 and, and, it, and it's just filled with frustration and regret because I honestly believe that in 99, we would have won the World Cup with ease uh, if we had Tash there. 
um, and we had that same structure and Malaga hadn't gone crazy. We had the players, we had the confidence, we had we had everything going for us. And at that stage in the world, the All Blacks were, were all over the place. Um, the Australians weren't fantastic. The English weren't great. The French were hit and miss. Um, it is probably the weakest World Cup year that I've seen uh, um, since 95. And, and we were the best side, I think, um, leading up to that World Cup. Probably what the All Blacks feel every, every time it comes to a World Cup, except for, for the two preceding this last one is that they always seem to play their best rugby between all cups. Um, yeah. But, but in, in, in our situation, we, I think we were the best rugby side in the world. I mean, we had, you know, we had the confidence, we had everything. We just had a coach who went crazy um, and, and dropped our captain <clears throat> that all of us respected and basically was the glue that held the side together in Gary Tashman. Brendan, have you got uh, a, a, any questions? Yeah, no, we, you've been, we've got lots. We can be here for hours, I'm sure. But uh, you know, I think I'm wondering if Mark has something to go and do. I could sit here at five o'clock. I think, I think we've covered Mark's career. I thought maybe just maybe ask him a bit about a couple of teammates. Um, you know, a, guy like J, a guy like James is quite, uh, uh, you know, quite, quite a character, and you played a long time with him. And a lot of people probably who, don't know J, who didn't know James don't understand the type of guy who was very misunderstood at times. Yeah, you know, Wayne Fabi, um, what player of the Sharks and, 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 the, and a guy we respect and like, I used to say, and Wayne was a Hilton boy and private school boy, and so I'm just trying to paint the background where he comes from. Fabi said that if it wasn't for rugby, he would never have met some of the human beings that he met in his life. Uh, because there were some very different people. James Small was one of them. Um, James Small was as eccentric as you get. You say misunderstood. You couldn't understand James. I mean, you say he was misunderstood. No one could understand James. McIntosh was one of the only people who could manage him. And Chris Christie, they managed him in very different ways. But James was just eccentric. I mean, I think in, in, he should have played basketball, American football in America, and, and, and played where, where people um, almost understand or, or, or like that kind of eccentricity. James was just different. And, and ultimately, in, in my opinion, it came down to just someone who was incredibly insecure. Um, James didn't believe in himself. Um, he didn't have the greatest uh, self-belief, didn't have the greatest confidence. And, and a lot of James was, was one of those things is uh, if you, uh, what's the thing? Um, you have to act it to be it. Um, and I think James was that. He was just... All is out there, but it is more to, to kind of prove that James was something special. And, and what the sad thing is, he was. He was a great rugby player, um, incredibly passionate. Um, he was a great guy, very kind heart. Um, the things he'd do for kids in the side without people knowing and, and give stuff away and his, his mass jerseys. And he was a very soft guy, but he was just a very complicated human being to play rugby with. I mean, there's a story I'll I, I just put in perspective quickly. We were playing against the Brumbies um, in Canberra. Uh, we had a, a defensive structure from a line out. Uh, the hooker, Blunt, or number two lock stays on defense in the channel. So the winger can either drop back or come up in the line. Depends what they do. The Brumbies used to always go same way, same way, same way, then come back wide. So we had a structure. They throw in, the ball gets tapped down. Johnny Adams shoots out of line. He shoots across. He breaks the whole defensive line. They sweep back, uh, Gregan and Lock and all that sweep back and we managed to stop them in our 25. But Johnny Allen has now gone AWOL. So James, as you come to, to the, I think it was a scrum, um, they knocked the ball on. James runs up to, to James, to, to Johnny Allen and starts swearing. You bloody idiot, don't you stay on your defense? Johnny Allen turns around. If you know Johnny Allen, you'll know he's not a man to abuse easily. It's, uh, he has a fuse about this long. He turns around and he's talking to me. And, James will say, oh, you stupid, of course I'm talking to you. And Johnny Allen charges after him. Now, this is in, in a live game. And the referee by the scrum and a hooker is charging off chasing our winger. He's now running towards the poles by Andre Joubert. And then Johnny realizes that he can't catch him when he's not even going to catch him. So he stops it and he comes back and we have the scrum. We, and at the end of the scrum, what happens, we kick the ball out and half time. Second half starts, we come on the referee about a kick to a start. The one goes, Sharks, you won short. Who's missing? James Small. Where's James Small? In his tracks in the grandstand. 
Macintosh says to him, what the hell are you doing? He goes, I'm not playing with that maniac. He wants to kill me. Johnny, I'm not playing with him. Don't tell anybody. So the game satellite feed stops for five minutes while the Mac basically tells Small, if you don't get in the field, you fired. So Small then takes Jack's it off, puts his boots back on, runs in the field. But he was just he was just different. But he made made things very interesting. I've got to be honest. <laughs> your um, your best and worst uh, roommate. <laughs> your um, my, my worst one, and he's actually a very good mate of mine, is Oli Larue. Oli Larue could snore and watch TV till about midnight, and then he'd snore from midnight until about seven in the morning, like you have never heard. It's impossible to sleep with him. I don't know. <laughs> I shared a room with him probably for about a week on a Super Rugby tour and never again. Uh, just love watching TV at full volume and then would snore at full volume until seven of them. I just couldn't sleep. Um, probably the, the best roommate and also the, the worst was Adrian Garvey. Garves and I shared a room for about six years. But Garves um, used to sleepwalk. Um, and it was the spookiest thing because he's a big man. Uh, 128 kilograms. What is more spooky or scary is that he used to always sleep naked. So you never knew you'd wake up sometimes and he'd be talking to you. I remember one time in Argentina, it was so hot and we had a bath fridge in all our rooms and we had to drink so much water every day to stop being dehydrated. And Garves and I had a routine one day out for the fridge, one day he'd for the fridge, one day out for the fridge, and the one day I forgot to fill the fridge, I was seeing it both bothered him. And I wake up. And God, me standing right there. Now you can just picture the scene, literally a meter away from me. So why haven't you filled the fridge? I wake up, it's like two in the morning. I look up, and you imagine what I'm looking at, and God, me staying right there. I'm saying, and ironically, I filled the fridge that night. I said, but God, I filled the fridge. No, you haven't. It's empty. And he'd opened the fridge door, and the bottle of water was in there. But, and he was in a rage. But he was naked, standing right next to my side of my bed. So I couldn't get up. I couldn't do it. So I'd try and call and eventually, but you can't, you couldn't wake him. He would then just like kind of like go back into him and then he'd half like kind of wake up in his own time, look around, and say, Oof, am I doing it again? I say, oh gosh. I mean, he's climbed over my bed. He was, I mean, the one night in the TV, the TV has a red little standby light. And I'm lying reading and next thing he goes, don't move, don't move. Why is that? And I don't know. Also, he says, sniper, sniper, 12 o'clock. So he's seen the red light. In the so, now, so then I just play along. I go, off, so what are we going to do? I don't know. Just kept, he'll give his permission away. But it was just a, a But there were a couple of scarier incidents with Garvey naked having some nightmares, which, which uh, I think it's, maybe it could be a family show, so I won't go there. But um, yeah, Garvey was, was a very entertaining roommate. If you put it like that. I also heard once you told a story about um, James Dalton and uh, knocking out Shorten Fitzperry or in a scrum. <laughs> no, the, I think that I'm trying to remember. I think it was '97 um, when we lost. So '96, '96 we lost in uh, we played Eden Park. Andre Finter got sent off for pushing Fitzpatrick's face into the ground. '97. Uh, '97. Yeah. 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 around like he had his head broken with a hammer. He was uh, absolutely. Show pony and, and the referee overreacted and sent off enter. So we were man down in the scrum. So we had a scrum just outside our 15 yard line, main grandstand to full of 22. And uh, our uh, uh, Tash, so our, our, it should have been Ruben, would have, should have gone to the right hand side to help the right hand shoulder. But he stayed on his left side. Um, and as they, as we put the ball in, they shoved and Fitzpatrick took a tight head of James Dalton. And as he took the tight head, he mouthed some, he called Dalton a uh, uh, female cat and uh, called, called him he was useless or whatever. And as we were breaking up, the All Blacks then went blind and they scored in the corner. But as the crowd was roaring, the lines was down and the referee, as we were breaking up, Dalton hit Fitzpatrick with an uppercut, but hit him like in the jaw, mouth, nose, jaw, but I just had a thud, and just knowing what, knowing what happens after that normally, the fists come out, and so I can remember I was buying an horse, and I pulled your face, my face back and came up expecting blows, but no one knew what it actually was. And we were all like still like half bound. I remember looking up, and as I looked up, Fitzpatrick was hanging, my guess his head, 
and he was out. And as he was trying to lift his head, have you ever seen someone who's been knocked out? Their eyes don't, their eyes almost roll backwards. And he was trying to like unroll his eyes, but they were like flipping up. I think he was just, just out, just trying to come around. But the blood really started trickling down his nose into his mouth. And eventually, like he half came and James was like waiting for the retaliation, nothing happened. And then, uh, then Fitzpatrick said to him, like, so dark, he said, this James, why'd you do that? And he said, because you're a pussy. <laughs> I don't know if Fitzpatrick knew what it meant, but anyway, that was like a uh, like, it was, you know, uh, one of the highlights of my career, because I think we all liked to hit Fitzpatrick a few times. There's another story about you at school with one of your teammates who had ran into a pole, apparently, at Selborne. <laughs> Shame. I actually got a message from the guy. I did an article. I'm not aware I did the article. And I, I said one of the funniest things in my life. Peter Reed was our first team coach. He played EP come off years ago. And we were playing against Paul Ruiz. Justin Swart was actually playing in final after. I was playing against Justin Swart in that side. Um, I, had a very, I was captain of the Selborne side, a very young side. And we were playing at the Butcher, not the Butcher Rasmus, uh, St. George's in PE. And um, we were warming up in, on the field outside, and then he had one light on. And uh, we warmed up behind the poles. So Mr. Reed came out and he said, Come, guys, there's warm up in the light so you can see everything. When we've been passing the ball around, and just start kind of like starting to warm up. So, <laughs> Ashley Cox, our center, very like excitable kind of guy, he, um, he gets up and he starts like running like this. And one of the guys had the ball, and he's like, Yes, 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 like that, pass the ball. So the guy, <laughs> Passes like the long pass team, but now he's at full, full taps, like right like, like all that warm up thing. And then as he takes the ball, he hits the pole, uh, the rugby post, but like square on. <laughs> and then he hits it. And it's like he'd been gun shot. He just like kind of flopped over backwards, lay there, and was just twitching. And like we all like stopped in shock and like, geez, like, he's just like dead. And eventually, like after about two, uh, five seconds, he comes around and he's like, geez. Who hit me? Who hit me? But we were laughing so much. I don't know how we, I mean, we lost the game by about three or four points, but it was probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen rugby in my life. <laughs> I think I'm done, Gav. Do you, do you have any, any more questions? Uh, just, 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 Mark, um, the one thing I was going to ask you is, um, I know I've spoken to you, and I mean, I, want, I wanted to sort of try and keep things positive, but I know that some of the times I've spoken to you recently, I've, I've got the impression you sort of got a little bit disillusioned about modern rugby, are you are you still in that space, or or are you now sort of like starting to enjoy watching it again? Yeah, you're right. But I don't think it was just me. I think most of the South African, the, the South African supporters and rugby supporters um, got in that, into that space. <clears throat> you know, it's the same thing I want to tell my, tell my kids. Um, you're never going to win everything, every 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 contest, every game you play. But it's how you play that really matters. And when you wear that Springbok jersey or you wear that Sharks jersey for me, you have to play to a standard and you can't keep anything in reserve. Um, you have to give everything, especially when you play for South Africa. And for me, I became very disillusioned at one stage where, where I saw some very talented Springbok players basically going through the motions. And rather than disrespect that jersey, rather make the stuff unavailable and don't play. Um, I like to think like, Tash, Juba, myself, Garves, um, Lem did, and the Coral, where we would rather have not worn that jersey than, than, than done that Springbok jersey a disservice, but by, by not being able to give 100%. And, and it, it's not just me, there are quite a lot of, of ex Springbok players who felt the same way. When Rossi came back in, um, I've been hell of impressed uh, uh, with, with how he's coached, but also I think one of the successes, um, what he brought back, he brought back that Springbok discipline. So one thing the Springboks have always been a non for. I mean, Kitch Christie, in the first times he ever coached, he walked in and he said to us, two rules. One, my name is Coach or Mr. Christie. Two, you never be late for a meeting, ever. He said, I suggest you all put your watches five minutes early. Because if a meeting starts at 10 o'clock, it starts at 10 o'clock, you don't arrive at 10 o'clock. So I know Rusty became very strict about discipline, about time. But also, he became about playing for the jersey, or what it meant. Um, I had the privilege of handing the Springbok jerseys out uh, the year before the World Cup. And I was very impressed with uh, Sir Khaleesi, with the senior players, with that sense of, of respect that those players had for the Springbok jersey. So for me, I mean, I'm not ashamed to say it. I sat with my one son and watched the World Cup final, and I cried off that final. 
because if, for me it was about they played like Springboks. They um, and, and they, they didn't just didn't just make the nation proud. Um, they made that Springbok jersey proud, and, and that for me is what it's about. Because that was your that was your main thing in your career was playing for the jersey. I mean, it started off in Southwark. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's something which I've and the, and the All Blacks have it as well, where, where they believe you play for their jersey. The jersey is the most important thing. Um, and for me, it's something I always held dear. Um, and I just think for probably four years, five years, uh, the, the Springbok setup and the players during that era were never playing for the jersey. They were playing for themselves, for social media, for money, for contracts. For that's all secondary. That's all secondary. If if you have that. The, the, the honor, the opportunity of playing a Springbok jersey, you give it everything you have. And that, for me, is the most important. If you win, if you lose, that's almost second. But you have to play it like it's your last game every game. And that, I don't think for a long time the Springboks were doing it. I don't think they were. But now they are. And that, that's awesome. Thanks, Mark. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Mark. Thanks, Gary. I think it's yeah. I think we can leave it there. It's been an hour and a quarter, yeah. So it's <laughs> quite a long, long chat. This. Um, I'm happy, Gav. You? No, of course. I was Mark happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, yeah. 